What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by my lovely co-host, Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And that's it. It's just us, you guys. How exciting. It's just, it's we, just the two of us. <laughs> uh, for all of those watching on youtube.com slash what's good gains, thank you so much for joining us over there. If you haven't subscribed, please do. But I just want to give a little apology. We've been dealing with some technical issues today during our record. We've tried three different video conferencing apps uh, to try to get a better picture quality for Steimer's camera. We just don't know what's happening. Uh, the I internet look better is not being when I'm slightly blurred. It's yeah. A... We hope at some point during the show that uh, the resolution will pop in. We've been kind of fiddling with it for a little over an hour now and we kind of were like, you know what? YOLO. We got we got to just record the show and go with it. Um, but thank you uh, so much for tuning in. If you're listening on podcast services, on YouTube, watching it on Patreon, we love that you're part of the What's Good Games community. And a big shout out to all of our pre-show patrons who got to watch this special episode recorded live. If you guys are ever interested in becoming part of our awesome Patreon community, that's patreon.com slash what's good games. Of course, it's the $10 tier and above that gets you access to our pre-show live stream every week and sometimes special live episodes like this one because we're recording the show in advance because while you're listening to this, I will be in Tokyo, Japan and Brittany will be somewhere in Europe on her cruise. And so we won't be able to get together to do a recording. And that way we, uh, so that's why we decided to do something a little different for the show this week. But when I'm back next week, all three of us will be reunited. It's going to be fantastic. We are currently planning for our monthly happy hour Q&A stream. I believe on September 27th. We don't have the exact time nailed down yet, but that's the date that we're eyeing since we'll all be back. And uh, if you guys are part of our Patreon community, as I mentioned, that is open to all of our patrons. It's one of the, the most fun times we have every month and we'd love for you to join us. Um, so that's happening next week. And I'll hopefully have some stuff to report from TGS because I am attending my first TGS literally as you're listening to this if you're listening to this on lunch day uh lunch day lunch day lunch day <laughs> mm, we think about food here we are a little bit hungry um so i wanted to let you guys know this episode's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge we were trying to think of what we could do for content for an evergreen episode that we have to shoot almost 10 days in advance of when it's going to be uh posting live um, if not a few extra days than 10 days. And we were like, why don't we go back through the archives of Dear WGG, where you guys write into the show and ask us questions. And we just kind of pick up some of the ones that have gotten missed over the last few months since we've launched Dear WGG back in May of this year. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take some questions from the chat that's happening. We're going to take a bunch of your questions from Dear WGG and hopefully... You guys get some uh, some good conversation and you enjoy the show. Uh, Steimer. Yes. Hi. How's it going? I just talked a lot just then. You did, but that's okay because <laughs> you're very good at what you do. <laughs> oh, thank you. I really I enjoyed guys... the uh, the Britton Steimer show, by the way. Oh, did you? Good. Yes. It was very odd for me. as When I finished recording that show, I was like, God, I felt like I just rambled. <laughs> it it was, it was not a, I felt like I talked way too much and I was like, you should just shut up. Well, you kind of have to ramble when it's just two of you, especially when you do a show as long as what's good games, you know, your place for video game uh, news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. And tonight some shenanigans when it's just the two of us, you really have to kind of bounce, you know, ideas off each other. And that usually means filling space with, with blabbering. <laughs> what if we did the whole show like in and then we just pretended like it was regular and that everybody else was crazy yeah it reminds like, me no. a lot of the game that i played recently uh celeste so i finally uh, i'm gonna talk about this on i talked about this on the show last week it's gonna be a little bit awkward if i <laughs> If I mention things that I talked about on the show last week, because we're actually recording the show ahead of last week's show, 
Which time is, travel which is really confusing uh but we're gonna try to keep a lot of our chatter about the games that we've been playing like spider-man tomb raider and uh, like i mentioned i've also been playing celeste and destiny 2 forsaken um to the show for last week since that's that's the more relevant timely show doesn't mean we can't talk about it uh when we're back but um have you played any celeste yet i played it a while ago when it was first came out yeah but so i like, haven't dived into it with the adjusted stuff okay well all of the dialogue in that game oh, yeah. is all like text and then the the audio is all like yeah i remember that and like it's i really like i know that i will get along well with somebody if they are down with that kind of thing like if if i can do, which obviously i can do with you and with Brittany, you're just like rah, 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 rah. Or like you're like yeah i got you like i know what you i kind of know what you mean just <laughs> by, by these weird noises that you're making you're like yes yes that's how you know you've been friends for a lie. while is when you can just like yeah. infer things from their inflection and their tone without actually getting complete sentences mm -hmm. it's just it's like we're on good. another level man like we don't even need words <laughs> we transcend language exactly <laughs> um okay oh uh, should we jump into our first question what do you think sure let's do it so this one is from back in june it's um from uh, a gentleman go back in time <laughs> yes. um wait uh, he has a pronunciation here let me just scroll over here uh, it's from william laroque it's a French name, not Spanish. Is La Roque traditionally a Spanish name? I have no idea. I don't know either. But um, William writes and says, what are your current underdogs for game of the year? Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, sir. Um, this is a kind of a monster question because there are always so many games that don't get recognized for game of the year consideration because there's just so much competition in the video game landscape these days. I think back to our game of the year conversations from last year and thinking about what was nominated, you know, at the game awards and what was nominated even just at E3 this year for the game critics awards, which we were a part of and how many games just did not get recognized. And so there clearly are far more underdogs than there are stars. I still think we're not going to get into too much of a game of the year discussion as who's going to win because this is about the underdogs i still think god of war is the front runner for me um after even after some of the initial holiday releases that we've gotten so far but obviously red dead redemption 2 is not out yet and i think that's really the only game that's going to challenge god of war uh for game of the year but underdog what about what about spider-man i think spider-man is an excellent game for what i've played so far which isn't much but I don't think it's going to beat God of War. I don't think it's necessarily going to be. I think it it'll be a it'll be a contender. Oh, it definitely say. will be in the like the top five nominations. One hundred percent agree. Like, there's no way that game doesn't get nominated. But I don't know if it will win. I think it'll win in other categories, like maybe best action adventure game or maybe best PlayStation game, depending on if there's console specific categories. But yeah, I still think God of War is the better game. And we can get into that a little bit more a little bit later in the year when we do our Game of the Year discussions. But underdog. I think underdog. Celeste, speaking of Celeste, is a great underdog for Game of the Year because it is a very excellently developed, excellently produced video game that I think is just too small to take over some of these giant monsters of games that have come out this year. And I say it's an underdog because what I really love about the game why I think it is going to be in Game of the Year discussion, if, if not just for Indie Game of the Year, but for Game of the Year overall, is because the gameplay is so fantastically executed in a way that people have been talking about for months. And I just was dragging my feet because it's a style of gameplay that I generally don't gravitate to because, you know, as I discussed in my, in my hands-on from last week's episode, is it is incredibly infuriating in a number of ways <laughs> it sets you up to fail intentionally like you have to fail to learn and that's generally a play style that i just don't enjoy but it's done so expertly in the case of celeste that i think it deserves recognition as an underdog potential for for game of the year and on top of that the narrative in that game was something that i was not expecting i heard good things about it but i wasn't anticipating it 
having such a profound impact on me and for people who aren't aware of what Celeste is about Celeste isn't the name of the lead character in that game the girl with the red hair which is I which is what I mistakenly thought her name is Madeline Uh, Celeste is the name of the mountain that she is climbing and that mountain comes to represent so much more than just its physicality as a mountain but really represents these trials and these obstacles that we face in our life and the way that they address mental health and depression and anxiety and doubt and all of these things that we feel but really rarely ever talk about is was so profound as I was playing that a lot of times in between me getting incredibly mad about dying constantly I think my total death count is over like 900 or something wacky um that I that you would have these moments these cutscenes that I was I would they would just kind of make you stop and go wow this is this is some deep shit <laughs> and that's why I really loved about it and I think if people haven't gotten uh, gotten a chance to try Celeste that I highly recommend you do it but maybe don't do the way that I did and play it only a handheld on switch mode if you really want to drive yourself nuts because as I tweeted about the other day that uh, the little the little joystick on the joy con not so great for the pixel perfect precision you need to master Celeste I've been playing that I was playing that in handheld mode and I was playing it nor like normal like there was nothing I didn't do any adjustments on it uh, and it was just the part, like, it's not super spoilery because it was, it's past the first leg of the woods, like the second part, this thing chases you. And I was like, I can't, it's fucking, I'm stressed. I'm so stressed out. I feel like I'm, I'm going to have a heart attack, but I need to go back and like play it with some of the adjusters so that I w- can mode. relax the assist mode. I wanted to do that with the assist mode, especially when something's chasing. Like I can't, I can deal with needing to die multiple times if I feel like I can go at my own pace and kind of figure it out. If something is coming after me and I'm trying to figure, I can't, I can't deal with it too much. Brain Um, overload. I just want to interrupt for a second to say our keeper in the chat says Steimer is original release and Andrea is remastered 4k (laughs) in reference to the quality of our video streams right now. I'm the OG. (laughs) You're like the 1997 original release. (laughs) Oh, yes. Those beautiful polygons. Bring them my way. Um, I'm with you on the chasing in Celeste. Like, it's it's stressful. And I was playing most of it on uh, an airplane. And I kept, like, having these, like, jerks. Like, when I would, like, get mad. And John kept looking over at me like, what is going on? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm playing this game. Just very upset. Just pissed off. (laughs) <laughs> but I am playing it on normal. I said um, previously on the show that I was going to play this with the assist mode on. And the game does a beautiful job of explaining at the front that while it's designed to be played in this specific way, they want people to be able to play it no matter your ability. And I love the way that they handled it. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. And like, I think the thing that was really the most poignant is at the very beginning of the game, there's just this screen that says you can do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can. I am going to play it on normal mode. And now I'm, so I'm still playing. I haven't turned it down yet, but like, you're not lying. Those chase sequences, the one in the hotel, especially is like having heart palpitations over here. (laughs) It's intense. It's very, very intense. Um, so what about you? Do you have any other uh, underdogs or game of the year games that you just have loved, but you think just don't have a shot at winning? I mean, I think, I don't know that I would necessarily super game of the year, but I think that Nino Cooney will probably get a bit of the shaft this year. Um, just cause there's a lot of other things that have come out. Uh, there's so and... many other RPGs that have come out yeah. this year. Like Dragon Quest, I think is going to definitely kick it out of like any conversations which is sort of sad because i thought nino kuni was really well done and i think it also solves a lot of issues people have with jrpgs in general uh not to say that dragon quest doesn't also address some of it but it sounds like for the most part that it's still very much an old school jrpg well and which, there's octopath you know, too right and then there's Oct- octopath is very much a it is a traditional ass jrpg like you've Characters don't level up if you're not with them, which sucks, super sucks. Uh, and so it's, I just, it's like super grindy. It's like what you think of when you think of a JRPG. 
minus I would say a cohesive story. Like each of them have their own stories, but for the most part, there's not a strong narrative to tie them all together. So you just kind of have to be really interested in what at least one of them is doing in order to keep going forward. And I feel like some of those stories aren't terribly interesting to me. Right. Uh, but I still enjoy it. It's kind of one of those games I just gonna I'm gonna chip away at for a long time because it is so grindy. You're just like, all right, <laughs> what am I doing now? And like, I I got everybody, so now I have to figure out what I want my party comp to be, and then just kind of mostly stick with that for the rest of the game because I feel like it really kind of pun uh, punishes you if you don't. Um, so. There's that, but Nino, I think Nino Cooney, I had way more fun with Nino Cooney. I had so much fun with that game. It was, um, hold on. Ah, yes. I'm like, hold on. I see, I see something incoming. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I was <laughs> typing her. I was ty for everybody listening to the show, I was typing Steimer a message, uh, a suggestion about how we could maybe improve the video quality of her thing. I did not mean for it to interrupt her. Normally when there's yeah. three of us, we can mask these secret messages. Well, it's just yeah. the two of us. I was it's, like, it's just the two of us. It's so just like, the two of know. us. But we yeah. can make it if we try. We try. Um, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you though. You were talking about no, characters. But I just, I thought Nino Cooney was a really like delightful, fun little game. Uh, and I had such a great time with it. It was one of the first games that I really just sat for a weekend and was like, I play this now. This is what I do. I am playing this game and I haven't done that in quite some time. Normally I've booked out my weekends to go outside, do shit. But I was like, nah. Be a human. Be a human. Be an, out be an outdoor human. And I did that with Spider-Man as well. Uh, but I don't, I think Spider-Man should get the accolades it deserves. So. It'll well, and you're not alone with Spider-Man. Clearly lots of people are taking to social media to talk about how they have been hooked and obsessed. Even John, like we got back from Copenhagen, which was, uh, like a 12 to 14. It was like a 14 hour travel day with time at the airport and the flight itself. And we got home and I was fully planning to just like stay awake for a couple of hours so and then go to bed at a like pretty early like at nine or whatever just so I could try to reset my clock and I ended up going to bed at like 10 p.m. and he stayed up until like three o'clock in the morning after having this crazy travel day because he was playing Spider-Man and couldn't put it down and I was just like dang I I, I have to I I'm kind of saving it now by the time the show airs I probably will have started it because um, I'm finishing Shadow of the Tomb Raider. My goal is to finish it before the show um, next week or last week. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've heard, heard, heard good things. So I, this is more of a predictor than like, this is basically me talking out of my ass is what I'm trying to say. Um, but I do think that I think Shadow of the Tomb Raider is going to be one of those games too. I think it's going to be kind of an underdog. I think people are going to forget about it because it's very samey uh at least from what i've played like yes they've updated it they've done things but it's a Lara croft game similar in the vein of the other ones that have come before it so i do anticipate it getting a bit of the shaft this year oh it's definitely i don't even think it's going to be an underdog i think it's not going to be in contention at all and that's kind of a bummer because it, it's clear how much work went into this game not just from playing it but from all of the time I've had the pleasure of spending with the development team across the many panels that I've hosted for them this year uh, and hearing firsthand about how much work and love and care they've put into this title and how proud they are of it. But I look at last year and how Assassin's Creed Origins, which I thought was a fantastic and phenomenal game, got nothing. Got like zero recognition for anything. Even oh, Horizon she Zero Dawn, which was to me, which was like our game of the year here at What's Good Games, won like one award, two awards. Yeah, it got it got the it got hosed. Or wait, no, what's that? That is that's not the saying. Got the shaft. I know, I know, it got the shaft. But it got like, hosed. Yeah, that's right. It got hosed, that works. That thing? Anyways, I yeah. I mean, I I wonder if that'll be the same for Assassin's Creed Odyssey this year too. Oh, definitely. I don't think yeah, Odyssey's going to get any recognition at all. I think Which that that sad, game is going like, to float under the radar. I don't even know if it'll it'll maybe make like best action adventure. Obviously, we haven't played it yet. We, we're just going off of the E3 demo that we played. Yeah. They put a new trailer out um, last week, but 
it's it's just like it's one of those games that people who vote for these things just kind of love the nostalgia or they love the new hotness like they don't want to give recognition to franchises that have been around and have continued to be successful year after year unless it's like a sports category or a racing category because then there's just so little to choose from you're like well i guess fifa's gonna win it this year <laughs> oh, yeah, FIFA wins it's it almost true, every true. year not to say that the, the the work on fifa isn't deserving obviously that game is one of the most successful games in the world for a reason because it is very well done but that being said i i think when you talk about game of the year contenders um even before red dead redemption 2 has been released i just i don't think that any game is going to be able to overcome that because rockstar is just such a darling in the eyes of so many of these video game outlets so and it sucks because I think that the work that the God of War team that Sony Santa Monica did was like, it's like, like I said, back when it launched earlier this year, it's like a masterwork of game making. Like it's almost everything about that game is fucking perfect. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, I'll get off my, uh, my pedestal now, my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you for the great question, William. Um, certainly a lot for us to discuss there. And I know Britt probably has some thoughts as well about games that are her underdog. So maybe we can revisit She's this. Just, she would just be like, Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition or whatever the fuck it's called. Yeah, Definitive Edition? And no, it is Enhanced Edition. Actually, honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember either. Um, but one of those. But yeah, it, that's a whole other thing. Me and my feelings on if games that have been previously released should even be she even be allowed to qualify but then in that case would you say that destiny shouldn't be up for any i mean i don't think they ever would put it in a game of the year thing but they like i imagine forsaken will be oh it'll be nominated for like, like best multiplayer for... or best ongoing yeah. game best live service yeah. game because now there's a lot of places that are adding that category and, and right rightfully so there's a lot of live service games that continue to put out a lot of content because previously and then like it may still exist in some voting outlets. There's a category like for best expansion. And yes. so uh, it could it could fit there. It could fit as games as a live service. But um, I, I think so. I've been really enjoying it. But then again, I've always loved Destiny, despite their missteps here and there. Um, I continue to think that it's a really excellently done game that will never get any kind of award recognition. But that's okay, because the Destiny community is strong. And there are lots of people who love playing it and... That's really all that matters. So, um, all right, let's move on maybe to another question. This one maybe shifting shifting gears just a little bit. Chris Lavornia asks, this is also from back in June. What's the deepest you've ever gone down a YouTube rabbit hole? Mine involves dogs. <laughs> uh, that could be really bad, but I'm assuming you just mean cute dogs on the internet. Well, you can't find anything. Well, okay. I take that back. You can, but YouTube does a pretty good job of policing their content, particularly if people report it, uh, sure. which is excellent. And, but there is a lot of weird, weird stuff on, on YouTube. I've definitely been known to go down some rabbit holes because those, uh, that little side box of recommended videos, like if you just keep clicking it and just keep clicking it, like it takes yep. you deeper and deeper. That's how I found the butterflies bit video. <laughs> oh my God, I forgot about that. Yeah, so we've talked about it on the show a couple of times. There's this, um, it's either, hold on, let me look it up. I don't want to misquote here. I was going to say it's either Japanese or Korean um, girls, but I should know what the difference is here. Um, mm, butterflies. Now I want some fries. Um, and it's, the Dark Twins. Actually, I don't know who the Dark Twins are. Let me look. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know who the Dark Twins are? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> if you guys haven't listened to this, um, it's basically these girls who are... In, let me see if I can get some audio here. Um, who are in these outfits that like look like butterflies. <laughs> can you hear it, Steimer? <laughs> Barely, yes. And they're just in these like really cheap butterfly outfits and they're, oh, you know what it is, is the, the stream is on. <laughs> ah, I was like, what's happening? Um, and they have these images of French fries in the background and they're just talking about searching for the best long and golden fresh French fry. And then they're like, um, we are, we are butterflies. 
like butterflies, yeah, but butterflies because French fries are so delicious. So that's how I found this video going down a YouTube rabbit hole. Um, I think it was from the pen pineapple apple pen video that I got mm. to this butterflies video. Um, do you do you remember the pen pineapple apple pen? Yes. Yeah, it's so classic. Also has two hundred and seventeen million views now. Holy bonkers! That's crazy. Yeah, I don't think like as of late, for the most part, when I go to YouTube, I don't. I kind of know exactly what I'm looking for, and then I get out. I bounce because I know how dangerous that algorithm is. <laughs> but um, I have. I watch a lot of beauty YouTubers because I just find it very relaxing for some reason to watch someone else do makeup that I will never do on myself. And there's been like a crap ton of drama lately. Like, I don't, I don't even know what's going on, but like, I just keep getting served all these videos of like, blah, like this bad thing's happening and this bad. And sometimes I click on them because I'm like, wait, what's happening? What's going on? Your clickbait's working. What's going on? But then I usually bounce out because I'm like, I actually don't care about you and your bullshit drama. <laughs> like, this has zero impact on me or my life. So I'm a leave now. Let me know when you're back to applying eyeshadow. Cool. Bye. I also very thoroughly enjoy makeup videos. Um, I am always so impressed by their blending techniques. And then I get really jealous because I'm like, man, you have so many amazing makeup brushes. And then I go to like Sephora or Ulta to pick up these brushes and they're all like $50 a brush. And I'm like, dang it. That's a lot. That's a lot of money to spend on brushes. I don't know. Um, yeah. And they have like tubs full of brushes. They have so many. They do. I'm like, I'm just thinking about how much of a bitch that must be to clean. Oh, I mean, like, I can't even like imagine. A whole day. That's a whole day endeavor. I just want to um, interject that the Dark Twins are actually based in Hong Kong, and it is a Cantonese song. Oh. So uh, my apologies. It is not, it's neither Korean nor Japanese. It is Chinese, um, and they are based in Hong Kong. So um, while well, Cantonese and Chinese are not the same thing, or is Cantonese a form of Chinese? Uh, great question. This is Maybe somebody in the chat can help me out with this because I am very much out of my depth because I do not know all of the dialects. It oh, is a Southeast dialect Asia? of Chinese spoken in the city of Gangzhou. I don't think I said that right. And it's surrounding area in southeastern China. Okay. So Chinese it is. Um, but yeah, makeup videos. There's a th That's a whole industry that really blew up around YouTube that I never anticipated when I first started making videos on YouTube back in the day. How-tos, of course, super popular. So why wouldn't it be how-to makeup? Because that makes sense for video because you can't explain really how how to do it verbally. I mean, you could, but it's not the same as seeing it visually. Mm -hmm. um, I remember watching this one tutorial for a Halloween look that I was doing and I didn't have the exact colors that she did, but I was like trying to like make it work and I got it pretty close. I was very impressed with myself, but it took like 45 minutes for me to just do the eyeshadow. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It takes a long time if you're doing something involved. I remember when I did uh, my Yen makeup for Halloween that one year. That, that was a similar similar story where I had a tutorial. I didn't have these colors. I had, like, one purple, which she actually has a lot of purple eyeshadow. And I was like, well, we're just going to make this work. And yeah, it took, like, 40 minutes, but I, I did get it there. Steimer, you, you finally popped in your resolution. Hooray. Yeah. I got upgraded. I got an HD remake. <laughs> I'm glad that you I'm glad that you're finally here. <laughs> that's that's great. Um well thank you for your question, Chris. I don't think everybody wants to listen to Steimer and I talk about makeup because we could probably, probably talk about it for the rest of the show. <laughs> I do love makeup. Do you miss do you miss working in skincare? Um, I mean it was so brief that no. But I still I because I'm still all over those skincare blogs and like I'm keeping track of all the new shit coming out. So. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like every time I see you or every time you come up here, you always have some kind of new product that you, that you bring with you and that you're working on. And you're like, you want to try this? And I'm always like, no, I'm afraid it's going to make me break out. And I'm like, nah, dog, it's good stuff. <laughs> I know. I just need to be a little bit more adventurous. Um, but now that I'm older, I'm starting to use like a lot more steps in my skincare 
than previously where I was just like, let's just splash some water on my face and I'm fine. And now I'm like, I got a serum for this, a serum for that, an eye cream for this, a special moisturizer for this, a different kind of moisturizer for this. I got three different masks. It's oh, I have a, I have a tub. Like, so you know the pole drawers in your fridge for cheese? Yeah. Usually uh, it's just full of masks. Mine You're like, has I don't no have food cheese, I have skincare. I have skincare <laughs> in that fridge. I have a small skincare fridge in my bedroom. I take this shit seriously. So are you telling <laughs> me that I need to get like a mini fridge for all my skincare? You don't. You have central AC in your house. I do you? not. I do not. No. I, so if your room, if your bedroom gets very hot, then yes. So here's my, anybody, and none of you care. I'm sure none of you care about this, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, oftentimes people will keep their skincare in the bathroom, which is bad. Don't keep it in the bathroom because it's hot in your bathroom and it's humid in your bathroom. And those are both two elements that make your products go off faster. So get them out of your bathroom. And then I lived in a place where like it was just it would just get so hot in the room or in my apartment that I ended up investing in a, in a small fridge for my skincare because then that way at least it keeps that from getting too hot and again from going off. Because if you're spending lots of money on these products, it makes no sense to have them then go bad. That's I mean, that's very valid advice. The lazy person in me that was like, but if it's not in the bathroom, then I won't use it. Because I've had to go to another room to get it. That's like one Just extra Just put it step. on your your uh, dresser. I guess I could. How big is this fridge that we're talking about? Is it like... It's like yay big. It's very small. Very small. Okay. like It's a small fridge. Could maybe fit a six pack of beer, if not less. Oh, could not even fit a six pack of beer. Okay. So it's like... It could fit like... It's like the little fridge four. that you see at your doctor's office where they put the pee samples. Yes. It is much more like that. <laughs> I don't know why that reference came to mind. Um, okay. Um, next question is from Kathy Lucas. This is from July. Hey. Kathy asks, with the rumor of Microsoft Xbox Scarlet, their next console dedicated to streaming games, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Is this really the future? Because sings in the tune of Whitney Houston's greatest love of all, I don't believe that streaming is our future. I had to do it for you. That was great. Um, well I'm done. an old fart. Insert fart noise here. <laughs> is that, that's a bad fart noise. You can do better. <laughs> Help me out, timer. I'm trying to like do the thing where you blow on your arm. Into your arm. But uh, not into your oh is it into your armpit is <laughs> <laughs> that good you nailed it okay you great. got it kathy Sweet. um and i still love buying physical copies of games what is the appeal of streaming games from the cloud especially with some parts of the world having crappy internet i also have concerns about latency both from game streaming and my own input and how that experience will be when you're in the middle of a boss fight and your internet decides to take a little dippy dip Anyway, thanks. Um, so this is a great question, and it's something that we haven't really dived into on the show at all. I know we've briefly talked about uh, these Xbox Scarlet rumors, but um, I'm with you, Kathy, that I don't think that streaming is going to happen widespread anytime in the, in the near future. I kind of likened it to how HD took forever to kind of propagate worldwide it took it's i mean it's still technically making its way around the world and there's plenty of places that still offer standard def channels to which i'm always like but why we're just we're in like an hd world now everything should be hd why are we even talking about we it are living in a hd world and i am an hd girl exactly there we go um, yeah, because you can't say high definition. It's too many. It's too many. Cuts, too many syllables or whatever. Um, I love the idea of a streaming only box, and I think that that's something that we talked about when Xbox One was originally unveiled back in 2013, when Microsoft was talking about their vision for what they wanted this console to be, and using the power of the cloud, their Azure servers, and the other technology that they have been developing for this box specifically. But then they rolled it back because people were so not ready for it even back then. And that was five years ago. I still don't think people are ready for it, despite the fact that many publishers continue to tout that digital downloads are representing upwards of 50% of their overall sales for video games in 2018. Yeah, but streaming is different than downloading. Well, right. But a streaming only box means you don't have any physical releases, meaning if you want to play a game you have to acquire it digitally, whether you actually 
physically download the data to be stored locally on a drive or whether you're streaming it, that still requires a high speed internet connection. In fact, I would argue that it requires a higher speed internet connection for a video game to work latency free. We haven't oh, seen yeah, anybody absolutely. successfully do this yet. That's, that's, that's the thing, right? We haven't seen anybody maintain digital quality over a streaming platform with video games. We've seen a lot of people try, but I have yet to see something work consistently. I think that's the key word here is that we've seen some people doing really great things, particularly streaming technology when it comes to live streaming. There's a platform that we've looked at working with and we still are, are hoping to work with in the future called caffeine.tv, which is kind of the, you know, the new kid on the block. They just accepted a round of funding from Fox, who is going to be buying a lot of Fox 21, who's buying a lot of content on that platform. And they are one of the people out there offering zero latency with streaming. And I know Mixer offers really low latency as well. But that's still different than trying to play a video game, particularly a PvP focused game in a world where you're going up against people with varying internet connections and you're streaming the game. I don't know. I I love the idea of it, but I don't even like I don't, I don't so. like the idea of a streaming box. I don't mind the idea of a digital box that like doesn't have a disc slot, whatever. You can only like download to this. Like if I if I just had to download everything, that's totally fine with me. I download pretty much everything right now anyway. Uh, it's just the matter of streaming itself. I don't like because I'm gonna get frustrated. I'm gonna want to sit down and play a game. It's like the internet's gonna crap out on me. It's gonna be a thing. Um, whereas I can just download and then play, and it's fine. Um, so that's for me. Streaming is not the future that I care for or want. I am all for a digital future, just not that particular version of it. Yes. Agree. Yes. So, uh, yes, yes, I, yes. I guess time will tell though, to see if, uh, if it happens. I mean, I think, I, I don't think it can be like a legitimate future for quite a while because as, as some people have also been mentioning in our chat, like, rural areas do not have the infrastructure to support it so you can't leave out that many people and be like it's the future it's fine like now nah, we need to build like better internet first everywhere before you even get to that point absolutely and i think that we're slowly getting there infrastructure around the world is catching up but it's going to be a while before the disc-based boxes or the digital download boxes go away. Um, there is rumors on the horizon of what Google is working on. You know, we've heard for months now that Google has been hiring big wigs from other companies, that they're working on this secret box and nobody really knows what it is. And hopefully they'll unveil it sometime soon. But the rumor is that they're also doing a streaming only box. And I think if anybody was going to be able to try to tackle the idea, the, the, uh, the issue of, of video game streaming, Google might be the one to be able to go after it head on because they have such a gigantic online infrastructure worldwide. And they have a vested interest in the actual physicality of that infrastructure, so much so that they've even, you know, installed their own fiber in many communities throughout the country. And... Google Fiber is not a thing that's sticking around, though, is it? I, I hope so. I've always wanted it. I felt like they were discontinuing that. I've anyway. heard mythical, mythical <laughs> stories of this Google Fiber. Question for another time, unless someone in the chat wants to educate me on that. But regardless, um, I think that they have the technology and the power <laughs> to, to possibly execute. But again, it's like a let's, let's wait and see. Because I think we all were real excited when PlayStation Now was first announced. And then when it launched, we were all like, wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. Sad trombone. Uh, it just did not work out. Um, but thank you for your question, Kathy. A very interesting discussion, nonetheless. All right. Next question comes from Charles. This is from early August. Charles writes, BioWare recently stated that they have teams working on Mass Effect and Dragon Age projects alongside Anthem. Do you think that something could be coming in the not too distant future for one of these franchises? Think maybe Christmas 2019? Or do you think that this announcement is more akin to Bethesda's announcement of Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6? You know, someday. 
Um, well, they didn't even really announce any. It's just saying that people are working on it is not the same as like announcing a game. Um, because of course they're working on some iteration of it. And that's such a vague statement to even say, like we have people working on it. Sure. That might be 10 people. Like that might be like, might be just, just a concept artist, right? Exactly. Like just some people concepting some shit, trying out a few game, uh, a gameplay design loops, like just figuring out what the game could even be just kind of scoping out that work. Because right now, I mean, I would be very shocked if it was not all hands on deck on Anthem. And I think they will let Anthem breathe a little bit before talking about Mass Effect or Dragon Age. I agree that they definitely need to clear the runway for Anthem to succeed, even though after we what we saw at PAX West, it's clear that Anthem is an entirely new type of genre for Bioware that they're really trying to create something different than anything the studio's done before and I really appreciate them for taking that risk and from what I've seen like I'm along for that risk everything looks great so far uh, and that game is coming out in what six months so we don't have too long to wait for it but obviously you know Mark Dara the executive producer on Anthem who's also been the executive producer for the Dragon Age franchise openly acknowledge that they're working on DA4 and that the team has been hard at work on it for quite some time. So maybe we'll get a teaser trailer uh, sometime in the not too distant future. I would love a, in a world where we could get a teaser for Dragon Age at the Game Awards, but I don't think that that's going to happen. I think it'll probably wait until next E3 before because EA traditionally does not do one-off trailers to announce things. They have like big fucking deal events right they're like we're ea we're the biggest publisher on planet earth we're gonna you know bring out the pomp and circumstance for a big announcement especially something as big as dragon age returning especially after how well inquisition did so but i mean i want more mass effect though i think is well, you're not going to hear from mass effect for a long mass time is going to take a bit of a stasis sleep i think yeah uh but dragon age and i even th i don't think i still feel like even them talking about Dragon Age at E3 is too soon. Uh, only because I don't think that the game is probably that far along. Like, I, And I think they hopefully wouldn't want to do the thing where they like draw out a really long PR campaign for it. Right. Um, and then also, again, like give Anthem some runway, give it some breathing room, because you also have to consider that there will be DLC for Anthem. They've already talked about that. Yep. I believe they said it's free. Is that a misquote? No, I, I believe they said that as well because okay. they're intending this to be like a, a live service game. They're intending to yeah. support it um, through cosmetic microtransactions, but no loot boxes. So an important distinction there. Um, and they want to, you know, keep the community to get together and, and release DLC. And so I'm gonna, it's going to be interesting to see how they roll that out. A lot of the conversation that we had with um, Mike Gamble at – Pax West, who is a producer on the game, re was really kind of fascinating how they're really changing up the way that Bioware has made video games like from the ground up, the way that they really had to reconsider a lot about this game. We talked about this on our Pax West panel, which, by the way, if you guys missed it, you can find the archive on our website, whatsgoodgames.com. And we talked about um, the briefing that we went to and how we got to do this extensive Q&A with them. And I had my notes on stage and we went over everything but i'm uh, i'm happy for them that they have this really cool project on the horizon and that i hope the launch goes well and it sounds like it's kind of an all hands on deck so even if there are teams working on mass effect and dragon age things that are coming down really far down the line right now it sounds like they've pulled everybody to polish 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 anthem to make sure that it doesn't have a launch like andromeda had and they're recognizing that and they have openly acknowledged that they made some mistakes with the launch of Andromeda and they don't want that to happen with Anthem. And so they're doing everything they can to make sure that doesn't happen. And I hope well, that that like, puts fans of Bioware or people that are skeptical after Andromeda at ease that you, you know, shouldn't go into this thinking that you're going to get burned again. I mean, yeah, it can't happen again. Like, I think that's kind of what, why they are talking about it is like, it's a realization of that's a mistake you can't make as a, developer that has the pedigree that you have 
And I know that it was not made by Bioware Edmonton. It was made uh, mostly by, fuck, is it Montreal? Montreal, yes. yeah. I was like, what's the city in Canada? But, uh, <laughs> um, and so I think that that's kind of, they're, they're in a tough spot with that. And I think the sooner, I like, again, like we've already said, Mass Effect's on ice, but I think we will either hear something about Dragon Age. Uh, the only way we'd hear about it soon-ish is if Anthem releases and like all of the Bioware fans are like, Mer! we hate this, give us our traditional thing. Uh, and then they might be like, okay, yeah, well, that's still coming. Here's a thing. Here's a, yeah, be nice. I hope it doesn't happen. That would make, that that would make me really, would, really sad. I would like them to have a nice thing. Yes. They are nice people. I think they deserve it. They're very nice people and they work really hard. Um, not to say that other people don't as well, but I would like for them to have a win just because as, as a Bioware fangirl. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, Steimer. We're all Bioware fangirls here at What's Good Games. And uh, mm. we know lots of you out there are too. In the chat, though, I see Art Keeper says, I have DAI, meaning Dragon Age Inquisition, sitting in my backlog. Shame. You should play it. Ding, it is ring excellent. the bell. Bell of shame. 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 Um, next question is from James Rodriguez. Also comes from August. Says, what's good, ladies? Hope you're doing well. If you could wake up one day with the ability to have pro-level skills in a game, which game would you want it to be? Keep up the great work. Whatever game I can make the most money at. Uh, League of Legends? <laughs> uh, I think Fortnite's got some pretty big pools right now, though. They do, but the top prize in the Fortnite pool still doesn't compare to the League or really Dota, right? Like, I think Dota is the game that you would want to be the best in, Dota 2, because they yeah. have the most amount of tournaments worldwide. Am I speaking out of turn there? Maybe? I think they had the biggest for a while, I think Fortnite came and was like, ah, cash money. But I think Dota had the biggest prize pool for a bit. Dota 2. The Dota 2 Invitational. Well, the Invitational, like, far what? outstrips the the Fortnite prize pool because the grand prize is so massive compared to the Fortnite pool, which, which makes the people farther down the bracket win more money which is um which is great if you want to come in like 15th and still walk home with some money in your pocket right Hell instead yeah. of walking home with nothing but um the international obviously is crowdfunded and so because of the compendium and all the things that they sell around the international if you guys aren't familiar with the the dota 2 esports scene it is a prize pool that's bigger than I think every other major sports pool except the Super Bowl. I think it's bigger than the MLB championship. I think it's bigger than the NBA championship as far as like raw dollars and how much the people who win take home. And obviously like there, you're not splitting it across as many players um, and the uh, teammates and things like that as uh, professional sports happen to do. But like just the idea that yeah. if you win the international uh, as part of like a team of five that you are taking home probably between two and $10 million, especially when you Ain't consider bad, like sponsorships and everything. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I would be really, really, really good at a MOBA and then I would make all the money and then I would fuck off to the middle of the woods somewhere and never <laughs> see <laughs> civilization again. <laughs> Yeah, being pro level at Fortnite, being like ninja level wouldn't be bad either cuz then I could just stream Fortnite if I was really good at it and maybe get the, some of them ninja dollars, but The trick is though, I would never want ninja ninja's life. Because when you when your life is a streamer, that's all you do all the time and anytime you take a day off, you lose things and it's like incredibly disheartening. So you feel like you can never leave or rest and that's just like this awful, vicious content cycle you can't that's, escape. Yeah, that's a good point. Whereas like if you're just really fucking good at Dota and you go win this international and you're like cash money and you just like invest it, you're, that's enough for me. I don't need all of the millions of dollars. I would just like a few million dollars. Yeah, because most pro esports players don't stream very often because most of the time they're practicing yeah. or they're scrimming with their team. Or yep. they're doing, you know, like drills and shit that they do at their houses. So they're not actually streaming. And um, that's a good point that I didn't think of. Because I remember Ninja publicly talking about how he took like two days off 
or something and he lost like 40,000 subscribers or something wild. Yeah, he lost some I don't remember the exact number, but yeah, he lost a crazy amount of subscribers and it's just like, man, I can't even imagine. That's like the worst feedback loop of all time. Yeah. If you ever leave massive number drops. What if let's just go down a fun little road here for a second. Okay, let's do it. What if money wasn't on the table? Okay. You were just going to be really good at something just for the sake of being really good at okay. it. And it could be any kind of game. It could be like bocce ball. It could be poker. It could be Scrabble. Oh. It could be anything. And that you were just like the best at it. Like what would you change your mind about what kind of game you would, you would pick? Badminton. Badminton? You want to be the best the badminton player best in the world? fucking badminton player in the entire universe because I love badminton so much. It's so <laughs> stupid. It's like... It's a sport that I question its existence. And I also just think that I get more exercise from laughing so hard when I play badminton more than actually playing badminton. But yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. I haven't played badminton for a long time. We should play. I just always love that. <laughs> you could call the birdie a shuttlecock. And I was like, where does that, yeah. what does that come from? I don't know. Looks like a tiny penis. But it doesn't really, but maybe just the tip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, now I have to put this up, right? Uh, I can't fit it in the window. That's what That's, she yep. said. That's what she um, said. I'm, um, I'm trying to think. There's like, I'm trying to think of what would be like a really fun thing just to be really good at that I could show off at parties. Like maybe, maybe like beer pong or bowling mm -hmm. or... Like, uh, what is it called with the bean ba corn cornhole? cornhole? Um, I recently learned that the reason it's called cornhole is because generally inside those sacks, it's not beans, it's corn. Oh, did not know that. I didn't know that either. I will, I had like one of those like mind blown moments. I was like, what? What? Why are there not beans in the bean bag? And they're like, I don't know. Traditionally, there was corn in the bags. That's why it was called cornhole because you threw the corn in the hole. <laughs> You're like, well, I guess that makes sense, man yeah um it's um it, it would be fun to be really really good at one thing though maybe i'd be like the best monopoly player in the world that could be fun but nobody would want to play with you yeah that's a good that's point the, that's the problem is like if you're just so stinking good no one's gonna want to play that game with you and then it you have a sad and then you're forever alone you're forever alone except with other people who are also really good but theoretically no one's as good as you. I know, yeah. So it's like you're just sad. <laughs> just so sad. Being at the top is a lonely place, is what I think we're yes. trying to get to, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um okay, here is um a good question. Um from Matthew Symes. It yeah, says you said it right. I did? You did. Yeah. He wrote in and Matthew you wrote in and told us how to say your last name. Yeah, it's, it's like signs like dimes and um, more times. And he asks video games are seen by the general public as a hobby for children, not adults. How do you ladies respond to the, you are too old to be, be playing video game statement. And, um, oh yeah. So he says the, he yeah. says the pronunciation yeah, right after this. Um, so this is a great question, Matthew, because I think as gamers, we've all heard this from somebody in our lives at some point that, you know, games are for kids and we shouldn't be playing. And I love that there's actual scientific research now that shows that playing video games is actually very good for you and stimulates your brain and helps keep your brain active and can help stave off a variety of mental disorders. And I think that's a really great thing to to say to people. But I always respond that there's there's a video game for everybody and that my mom just started playing video games not that long ago on her phone and after taking her to PAX, uh, she wants to play more and they want to get into other types of games. And I find that that, re that really exciting. We've had people write into the show who are in their 50s, 60s and beyond uh, talk about their love of games. And Britt's grandma, you know, we talk about Britt's grandma all the time. <laughs> um, it's tough when people put down the hobby or the thing that you love, especially when they don't understand it. And instead of coming from a place of wanting to learn more, they come from a place of judgment and dismissal. That always hurts and I think for us particularly being women in the industry there's always that added 
caveat of not only are we like, adults playing at video games for a living, but like, do you actually play games is something that we get asked on the regular and that yep. sucks double. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. Cause then it's like, not only do you, do I not think you do this? I don't know. The whole thing is like, so in, it's insulting on multiple levels. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, shake fist. <laughs> It's it's definitely frustrating when people don't see the upside of video games, but it's tough. You know, I think a good example is when you look at the local news response to Fortnite over the last couple of months and some of the stories that have been coming out about Fortnite addiction or, or if you see some of the stories that came out after the incident in Jacksonville around the Madden tournament and how local news just doesn't even get it. They don't understand what video game culture is. They barely make an attempt to learn about it and to talk about it. Um, from my own personal experience, I've been asked to be interviewed by a couple of different major news organizations for my opinion on video games. And I had the privilege of being asked to be on a show for Vice called The Business of, the Business of Life. And I was on the video games episode. And that show was all about looking at the numbers, the data. It was hosted by a data analyst who works in mainstream journalism. And so she doesn't have a specific um, field of study in any of the one episodes that we did uh, or that she hosted, but instead is a, a numbers person in crunches. And it's like a statistician, for example. And so when they asked me to be on the show and they kind of showed me all of the numbers that they were going to be talking about, it was clear to me that they did not understand video games as an industry or as a culture because they would kind of pitch these questions. And I'm like, you're really framing this all wrong. It's almost misleading to a point. And it's frustrating for me to have to try to like educate people about how mistaken they are about video games, not only as an industry and as a business, but also as a culture to be like, you have this antiquated idea of what a gamer is or what video games are. And it feels like you don't even care to learn about it. And on one hand, that makes me very angry as someone who's been in this career now for over a decade. But on the other hand, after seeing the way that some people in the gaming community lash out at those people who are trying to make inquiries and really kind of pushes them away, I don't blame them for not wanting to dig deeper. You know, it's yeah, I mean, it can be a very prickly place. Uh, if and there's a fuck ton of gatekeeping happening so I don't I can't blame anybody for not wanting to be part of it or for you know being a little gun shy whenever they're asking questions but um I damn it I had a point and then it just like derailed now it's the fucking ditch. I don't know where it went. No, you'll find it. We were talking We were talking about gatekeeping and I think that's such a great word to use because it does feel like our community has these artificial gatekeepers, really bullshit gatekeepers because gaming is for everybody and anybody. And it's frustrating when people want to understand they get pushed away. So then it perpetuates this idea that video games are only meant for kids as like a distraction and aren't good for you. Rot your brain, so to speak. Even though I was just watching, rewatching uh, Infinity War. And, you know, the big thing there is like you got Teen Groot walking around with his little handheld gaming system, right? And yep. Rocket being like, put that game away. It's going to rot your brain. And I'm like, no, it won't. It's actually really stimulating no, for you. It's, if it, especially if it's like a puzzle game. It's actually pretty good for you. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I think that was that was kind of what I was going to go off of is It's the frustrating, the most frustrating part is when people dismiss it as a waste of time. But I think Brittany has also said this before where it's like, yes, but have you ever binge watched an entire season of things on Netflix? Probably. How is that time better spent yep. than me playing a game? And I would also argue like games are much, there's like so much more interactive. They take so much more effort than you sitting on your couch and watching something, uh, which is why sometimes I can't even play games because I'm like, I'm so tired. I can't even muster the mental capacity to play something right now so i'm just gonna watch a tv show like tv is my easy basic ass like medium of i can't function but i need something yeah. to be happening Agreed. so like i will watch a show on netflix but i'm not really that into it i'm based it's just there sort of as noise um but games at least i'm like hey man i'm like getting an interactive story i'm if i'm stuck in a particular place i have to problem solve my way out of it 
Like there's, there are things happening here. <laughs> this is, this is good shit for the most part. Yay. Video games are good. Stop yes. hating on video games, people. Um, okay. We'll do just a couple more questions before we wrap up this episode. Jennifer McNichol wrote in and asked, Fox 21 acquired the rights to a television adaptation of Vampire, the game. Did we decide if it's Vampire or Vampire? I don't know that we did. Okay. If somebody in the chat knows or has a thought, let us know. Do you think this might mean we will not get another game for this IP or maybe bring more attention to the game or we could get another? I know parts of the game were frustrating but still enjoyed my time with it and was looking forward to where it might go next. Um... Just because a company has acquired the rights to a television adaptation does not mean they've acquired all of the rights to the game. So I wouldn't be worried about uh, Don't Nod not being able to make a follow-up to the game because I'm pretty sure they have retained the IP rights to make whatever video games they want. I think that just means that Fox 21 has the rights to only do something with it on television. Yeah, similar to like Netflix and stuff when they got Witcher rights. Like that, that doesn't mean that CDP can't do something with it now. Right, exactly. Um, I actually didn't play any of this. Obviously, Britt is the one on our team who played this game, so maybe we should have saved this question for her. Um, but I think it's interesting that we're seeing more and more of these uh, these studios become interested in games because video games have become so big in the last five years. You know, obviously, gaming has been growing for the last couple of decades and we know from just raw data that it's bigger financially than movie and film or excuse me movie and tvs combined as far as like gross revenue but for some reason people still seem to think of games as small like the video game industry is not being as big and while it might not be as widespread i think that you know the people who have been working in games and developing games have been very successful and so I think Hollywood is now like, hey, we want to. We and maybe we should take notice of this. Yeah, also, we... you guys have some interesting IP ideas, like because we're just rehashing old shit over we're here. We're remaking over Overboard. Well, we shouldn't be. Yeah. So we, we need something new. We need, we need something, man. <laughs> Give us anything. But I, I know that someone's going to be like, man, but Witcher is based on a book, not a game. But I will say you would not know about those books were it not for those games. Right. Unless you were, unless you lived in Poland, you would not know. <laughs> like, that's an interesting idea because I immediately also think of like Game of Thrones and how many people had no idea about the book series until HBO announced that they were doing a Game of Thrones television show, like back in yeah. back in the in the day. Um, obviously, that that series is a best selling series, so it's not the same as the Witcher series, but. But to... even still, it expanded its audience because even I, I had never heard of those books. And only when I started watching the beginning of season one of Game of Thrones did I go, you know what? Actually, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to go read all these books that whatever he's written so far. Uh, and I did. And I really enjoyed them for the most part. And so I think that it's sort of a similar thing. And I think that this could actually bring more, drive more people to be interested in the game because they're like, oh, what? Well, what's the story about? Maybe I'll pick it up and, and give it a shot. Yeah, absolutely. But I I think when you talk about vampires specifically, that it's a genre of film that is, to me, already has a built-in audience. There's a ton of people that love vampire stuff. Oh, Anne it's... Rice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I know that. I, you, do, you do. Yes, you do. Anne Rice books? Oh, yes. Vampire? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know. I just think I when I think vamp that. vampire movies and TV, like my favorite, I think of all time is Interview with a Vampire. Yeah, that's by Anne Rice. Oh, well, there you go. I actually never read that book though. Oh, I read the book. I read like all of her, <laughs> all of her vampire books. I've read like a uh, vampire list. Like she had more that came out after that. Maybe I should go and back and read that. I'm looking the, for some new stuff to read. Say it's called the witching hour Anne rice the witching yes the witching hour like that sort of series too i read a lot of Anne rice i was thinking about reading the book series that true blood is based on i mean i think it's called true blood the, i think it's called no i think it's called the sookie saint james something let me look this up the sookie stackhouse novels that's what they're called that's sookie saint james sookie saint james is from gilmore girls <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just the only two characters that I've ever known that have had that name, Sookie. Oh no, the Sookie Stackhouse series. Yeah. It's got three stars on Amazon. I feel like they're just trashy, like romance novels, but not really romance. But well, I mean, let's. I read like the show. I read Fifty Shades of Grey, the series. Did you like it? I liked the first one, but like we all know that the writing in those books are fucking terrible. Hot garbage. They're bad, and they get it gets progressively worse. So I actually didn't end up finishing the third book. I watched the second movie, and. I was like, because John was out of town because he always gets weird when I watch a movie like that. He's around. He's like, I don't want to watch that. I go, I don't blame you for not wanting to watch it. <laughs> so I watched it when he was gone. It was like on HBO or something. And I was like, oh, this is on. Why not? Why not take a look? I read the book and it was bad. It was not. It was not good. It was like really terrible. And I was like, well, I was hoping that this would be like softcore porn and it wasn't. <laughs> I have it. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's the only the only way it could be good is if it's softcore porn. I know. I mean, obviously there were some racy scenes and some some sexy scenes and a lot of Dakota's boobs, but um, I was expecting it to be more graphic considering how graphic mm. the books are. Books are. But it wasn't. Yeah, I have not read those books, nor have I seen those movies, but Anne Rice gets pretty racy. Um, and I did read um, the fucking Twilight series, but... God, well, that's young adult books. though that doesn't that get is young it. adult yeah, yeah yeah sorry that's not i did not mean to insinuate that's like that some it was... some some tongue kissing and maybe some dry humping <laughs> i mean they have sex at once they're married they have sex that but makes sense it's um it's like very much just alluded to and they're talk about like they talk about how they do it all the time but it never goes into graphic descriptions of what's happening it's just like oh man we can't get enough of each other and you're like yep cool <laughs> use your imagination i suppose i uh, well i guess when you're like 14 you have a pretty vivid imagination oh, yeah. about like, what oh my god i bet it's so good i bet it's like this and this i was like wow well, it'll be disappointed in later in life it's okay. <laughs> sad but true um all right <laughs> uh let's see here this i think will be our last question from billy Billy asks, hi, ladies, what are some of your biggest gaming regrets? Whether that means you didn't finish or play a game or something that you didn't you did in your career that you regret. You can take this any way you interpret it. Can't wait for the next episode. Much love, Billy. Biggest gaming regrets. Uh, I think one of the games I wish I had finished and never did, but have a shot at doing again, thanks to our rehashing of old shit, is Catherine. And what happened with Catherine was I was really into it and then I went on vacation and then I came back and could not, for the life of me, remember how to solve the puzzles because how the game works is the tutorial, like each level you kind of like learn a different move and you learn a, a different way of stacking these blocks. And if you forget all of that, it's real hard to relearn it. You gotta just go back <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah, so um, since they are remaking that game, I will definitely give it another shot and try and, and try and go through. But for the most part, I'm okay with like leaving games if I need to. I don't regret not finishing the last South Park. Just was not enjoying myself anymore. Do you? So that's a non-regret. It's a non-regret. I'm saying like it, it. The fact that I regret not beating Catherine is like is a legitimate feeling because I don't always feel that when I don't finish a game. Yeah. Also, said it was. I need to finish Hellblade. Oh, same. I've heard nothing but good things, and I've heard it's short. So I also haven't finished it. Is, it is. It's just so emotionally intense that you have to be prepared for that in some capacity. But I just feel like I'm, I just need to suck it up and do it because like, I'm so tired all the time anyway. I can't imagine there being a day when I'm not feeling that way. It's just like, yeah, just fuck it. Just go. Just play the game. Just do it. Yeah. That's how I kind of felt about Inside. And I, I started playing it and I've played through a good decent chunk of it. I think I'm actually getting pretty close to the end and I just keep putting it down because it's so intense in a way that I just can't deal. Um, because like you're this little kid and you keep getting, I, you keep dying in these really terrible ways. And I'm just like, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. Um, but, um, one of my biggest gaming regrets is 
never playing several major classic series because I was so focused on racing games and Super Mario Brothers when I was a kid that I completely missed out on some classic franchises. And I know that I could go back and play them, but like, am I going to? Probably not. Like, never played the Castlevania series back in the day. I played like a little bit at preview events here and there. Never got into Mega Man. Um, never got into more modern series like Metal Gear. Just, just never did it. Just no, it was, it was not my thing. Um, there's just so many series that I look back on as my peers that have a lot of information and a lot of knowledge about that. I'm just like, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you. And it was something that I really struggled with early in my career of video games because I had such a specific deep knowledge of a very small amount of games and a very small amount of genres that when I went to start working in games professionally, I got a lot of judgment and a lot of shit, quite frankly, from my coworkers about not having knowledge about specific types of games and <coughs> gatekeeping. <coughs> no, no, really. It was. It was a lot of gatekeeping and about about them saying like you're not a real gamer if you never played this game and how can you call yourself a true gamer if you've never done this? And I was just like, but I but I did this thing over here and you haven't and done that. that. Like you're a fucking kid. Like yeah. what <laughs> How are you? Sp- you're not like, um, excuse me. I really need to make sure that I play all of the Metal Gears or later in my life, people will not consider me a real gamer. Like, no, no, you were, you were a kid. You were playing what you enjoyed. There's nothing wrong with that. And it, like, I have a similar thing to you, Andrea. Like I didn't play a lot of that stuff growing up because we bought consoles, but we never bought games for them because games were fucking expensive. So we had like three games and that was what you got. And then we played a lot on PC, but a lot of those quote unquote classic franchises were not on PC. And so I missed out on a lot of those things. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would try and do the same shit where it's like, well, you're not a real gamer if, and you're like, eh, you know what? I played games you've probably never played. Like everyone's out there playing something different. They're enjoying what they're enjoying. So. Leave everybody alone. Thanks, Dimer. That makes me feel better. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's one of my regrets. If I could go back and play more and do more knowing what I'm doing today, I would do more. I would play more. I would I would expand my horizons more. But man, I was just so into Cruising USA, you guys. <laughs> I mean, come on. Why not? I mean, I was into like, do you have any idea, any idea how much time I wasted in pets with a Z? I don't. I don't even know what that game is. Okay, so it was. I think it was Ubisoft. Oh, let me look at it. Let me let me Google this real quick. Pets I'm game. Sure it's, yes, Ubisoft. So it was this old game where you would. It was basically just a kennel. Like you, you would open the game and it was just a room, like a really basic ass, boring ass playroom, and you could bring out I think like up to two pets at a time, and. Either or you could buy cats with a Z or dogs with a Z or together that it was pets, um, and so I this was where I learned HTML. I taught myself HTML because I wanted to build a kennel because internet had just become a thing, and so one of the the sticks with this game is you could have an online kennel. You could take the files and like adopt out pets that you had bred because you could breed these pets. Like it was like this fucking weird ass rabbit hole that I was in for a really long time. And I got, I mean, I don't use that knowledge whatsoever today. I use, I mean, maybe HTML, I actually do, but the the knowledge of pets that never comes back to help me in my gaming career (laughs) ever. But so yes, that to your point, that time probably would have been better spent if I was playing like Zelda, but I didn't. And you know what? I don't regret it. Hashtag no regrets. Hashtag no regrets. <laughs> because fuck, like it's, it made me who I am today. The giant dork that I am. So Billy, I think the response to your question really just comes down to we don't have regrets. We could make up some regrets, but when we stop to think about it, actually, we had a lot of fucking fun. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> Games are fun. Heck yeah. What a great way to end this special episode of What's Good Games. Uh, Thank you so much to everybody who wrote in, uh, dear WGG. Again, if you guys want to be part of that awesome community, patreon.com slash what's good games. We 
love our community over there. Uh, some really fun folks. And like we mentioned at the top of the show, we have the happy hour Q&A happening on September 27th. And you guys can get in for just $1 a month. You can't even buy a soda for a dollar anymore. <laughs> and if you, <laughs> if you enjoy what we do here at What's Good Games and would like to help support the show and let us know that, you know, you want to be part of that community, you can do so. And there's lots of cool different things that we offer over there. Patreon.com slash What's Good Games. Uh, Steimer, what do you think you're going to do this weekend? Are you going to play anything fun? Are you going to yeah. go for a hike? I did a hike yesterday. No, not yesterday. Wait. Yes, yesterday. <laughs> but in when this podcast airs, will be two weeks earlier. Two weeks ago, you did a hike. <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, I did a hike. <laughs> um, I will probably still be playing Doom Raider. Uh, and I'm going to try and get back into Destiny. Yes, I'm so ready to help you. And so are the What's Good Guardians. And thank you to everybody who's reached out over email or a message. I know I still got a couple of messages in uh, at Bungie.net that I'm getting to respond to, but we're trying to get as many people in the clan as we can. Uh, the raid is coming out. Uh, well, by the time this episode airs, we'll have been out for about a week. And so when I get back from Japan, like I definitely want to jump into the raid and, and see how that is. And been having so much fun with Forsaken and, and really Destiny in general. I'm really excited to see where they go with this continued content plan with the season pass that they have to, to see if it's worth it. Um, hopefully it will be for people. And I know people have some strong thoughts about, you know, Destiny charging additional content after charging money for the expansion. But um, I guess we'll have to wait and see if it'll end up being worth it or not. And clearly, you know, I'm going to talk about it. I can't help myself. I don't want to say I'm a Destiny addict, but I kind of am. I yeah. brought my console to Copenhagen to play Forsaken. That was a thing I did. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I'm probably going to have it in Tokyo as well. Because there'll inevitably be a night where I'm jet lagged and awake at like 2 o'clock in the morning local time. And there'll be nothing for me to do in the hotel room. And I'll be like, well, wish I would have brought my console. So I think I'm going to bring it. But um, cool. thanks, everybody, for tuning in this week. Again, if you have not yet subscribed either on podcast services or on YouTube.com slash What's Good Games, it greatly helps us out if you subscribe. If you want to leave a rating, we would love that too. If you can't support the show financially, we would 100% understand and don't want you to sweat it or get stressed out about it. But maybe, you know, drop a like. Drop a drop a little description or, or a little message about what you think about the show in the, in the reviews or give us a rating and hit the subscribe button. That really helps us out a lot more than you know. So thanks everyone for listening. We hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you next time. Bye.